In 2018, we examined a number of unexplained deaths and disappearances within North America's national parks and rural regions. Over time, this phenomenon has come to be known as the missing 411. This week, we delve into further examples of these mysterious incidents. Join us as we go back to the woods. In 1997, David Politas retired from the San Jose Police Department, having spent over two decades serving the people of California. In the years that followed his departure from law enforcement, he began to spend time exploring the national parks and open spaces of the United States. But what started as a leisurely and enjoyable pastime would lead him down an unexpected and terrifying path. It was a chance encounter with a park ranger on such a journey that Politas first learned of the staggering number of unexplained deaths and disappearances which take place away from the hustle and bustle of the continent's towns and cities. The majority of these occurrences were written off as the result of natural causes or misadventure, despite evidence which seemed to indicate that some third party must have been involved. As Politas spoke with the various agencies and individuals responsible for patrolling these areas, he began to realise that a large number of deaths were taking place every year, which were not limited to one particular geographical area. They all seemed to share traits which caused them to stand out amongst more straightforward accidents or homicides. In many of the instances which Politas researched, the victims had somehow disappeared whilst only a short distance away from either safety or the companions with whom they had been travelling. In others, their bodies were found hidden in seemingly inaccessible places, sometimes staged in bizarre poses, or with items of clothing which had been removed. One of the distinguishing features that sets David Politas aside from other commentators in his field is that he does not have an answer to the questions he poses. Whilst others imply these incidents may be the work of serial killers, cryptid attacks or alien abduction, Politas simply asserts that something inexplicable and malevolent is at play. One of the earliest occurrences identified by him as bearing the hallmarks of a missing 411 case took place in northern Colorado during August of 1958. At the time of the incident, Bobby Bizzop was just 10 years old. He was attending a Catholic school retreat along with a number of other boys at Camp St. Malo in the foothills of the Rocky Mountain National Park. The only son of a serving Air Force sergeant, Bizzup suffered from severe deafness and could only hear effectively with the assistance of a hearing aid. He was a shy child, preferring his own company to that of his peers, but he loved the peace of the outdoors. On the 15th of August at about 6pm, Bobby was playing alone on a hill path just above the camp, when one of the counsellors approached to tell him that dinner was being served. It was only a short way down the trail back into camp, and the counsellor walked just ahead of the youngster. As they neared the outer buildings, the man had turned around to ensure that Bobby could read his lips whilst he spoke, only to find that the boy had vanished. The counsellor ran to fetch help, and the adults in the camp immediately headed back up the trail to look for Bobby, who was nowhere to be found. Over the following four days, up to 300 people, including airmen from Lowry Air Force Base where Bobby's father was stationed, combed an area of roughly 16 square miles. Bloodhounds were provided with samples of the youngster's clothing, 
and divers rigorously searched every body of open water. But it would be the best part of a year before any clue relating to the boy's disappearance would be found. On the 6th of June 1959, counsellors leading a hike through a ravine to the north of the camp happened upon a heartbreaking discovery. Lying just off the trail ahead of them was what appeared to be a pile of abandoned rubbish. On closer inspection, they found that it was in fact a collection of small human bones and scraps of clothing, in the midst of which lay a discarded hearing aid. Investigators were dumbfounded. The ravine in question was popular amongst hikers and had been used regularly during the year since Bobby disappeared. It had been combed several times as part of the original search effort, but more perplexing to them was the location. The point where Bobby's remains lay was five miles away from the camp, 2,500 feet above sea level, cut into the slopes of Mount Mika. Why had the shy and nervous 10-year-old travelled such a significant distance in the opposite direction to the camp, and how had his remains somehow managed to escape detection along a high-traffic route, which had been repeatedly searched by rescuers? The camp counsellor reported hearing no such commotion usually associated with an animal attack, so if Bobby had been taken, it was done so, swiftly and silently. Forty years later, another boy would disappear in near-identical circumstances, 50 miles north of where Bobby vanished. It was the morning of October the 2nd, 1999, and a group of hikers were walking along the Big South Trail, situated on the far side of the Rocky Mountain National Park. Amongst their number were the Atadero family, including their youngest member, Jared. Three-year-old Jared had been overwhelmed by the sheer scale of the forest as the group had made their way along the trail and begged his father to let him run ahead. It was a bright sunny day and the youngster was wearing a rather distinctive beige coat, so Alan Atadero had agreed, joking with the other hikers as his son ran on approximately 100 feet ahead of them. A short distance away, Jared had stopped to talk to a pair of fishermen asking if they had seen any bears. The two men could see the rest of his family only a short distance down the trail, and so had chatted with the boy for a few moments, before he continued on his way. They would be the last people to see him alive. When Alan and the other adults walked past the fishermen, they had initially been unconcerned about having lost sight of Jared. They continued to walk, assuming that he was hiding, and would jump out from behind a tree at any moment. But as the minutes passed and he did not reappear, they grew alarmed and split up to search for him. When deputies from the local sheriff's department arrived at the trail that afternoon, several witnesses reported having heard a child cry out at the time of Jared's disappearance. But they were keen to stress that what they heard was a playful shriek, like a child playing a game with someone rather than crying out in distress. Over the next couple of days, an extensive search and rescue operation was mounted, during which an Air Force helicopter which had arrived from Warren Air Force Base experienced a sudden engine failure, crashing into the forest and injuring its five passengers. After an eight-day search involving over 200 participants failed to locate Jared, the operation was reluctantly called off. In May 2003, two hikers were exploring the woodland surrounding the trail, approximately half a kilometre up from the last point where the boy had been seen, when they came across several items of children's clothing. Two white and grey tennis shoes sat lined up alongside one another, whilst nearby lay a beige jacket and some blue trousers, both of which had been turned inside out and neatly folded. Investigators were called and were immediately struck by how pristine the garments were. Even though the items had been exposed to the elements for over four years, they showed no signs of degradation. A fingertip search discovered a skull fragment lying in the bushes behind the clothing, and one of Jared's teeth was found underneath a nearby log. It was later confirmed that this part of the trail had not been searched, as the helicopter crash had caused the rescue team to divert. 
the authorities believe that Jared was taken by a mountain lion, a judgment his family refused to accept. They point to the fact that the recovered clothing was forensically analysed, and no animal hairs or saliva were present. There was no blood on any of the garments, and the fact that the clothes had been removed and turned inside out seemed to preclude a lion attack, or indeed any other predatory creature. Much like Bobby Bizzard before him, it was as if some mysterious force plucked Jared Atadero from the trail, leaving no sign of its existence. In 1981, a similarly puzzling disappearance had taken place in another of Colorado's national parks. Maurice de Metz was 84 years old, a reverend and religious scholar who had a long-standing love of the outdoors. On the morning of April the 29th, Reverend de Metz had asked his friend, David McSherry, to accompany him on a trip to the Pike National Forest, where he hoped to sift in a local creek in search of topaz. He was in poor health, suffering from severe arthritis and a blood disorder, and McSherry was more than happy to assist the older man in walking between the various sites he might identify. McSherry had driven a short way along Rampart Ridge Road, near to the Rampart Reservoir, when the Reverend asked him to pull over. He had spied a small sandy pit 50 metres away from the roadside, and asked his friend to support him as he walked over and settled down to dig. After making sure that Demetz was comfortable, McSherry then went off in search of his own dig site. Both men had been working for about two hours without success, before McSherry decided that it was time to call it a day. He gathered his tools and returned to Demetz, informing him that they would be leaving shortly. He then walked a short distance to where the car was parked and loaded his equipment, but when he returned to the sandy pit 15 minutes later, he found it was now empty. There was no sign of Reverend Demetz or the tools that he had been using. Even more perplexing, the only tracks that McSherry could see were where he had walked the old man into the pit and helped him to sit down. It did not look like anyone else had either entered or exited the small patch of sand. Although improbable, it was possible that the older man may have gone off to attend a call of nature, so McSherry returned to the car and sounded the horn. But the Reverend did not reappear. McSherry panicked and drove straight to the nearest police station to report his friend missing. When they returned to the site, the police officers who accompanied him became equally concerned. There were no fresh tracks anywhere nearby, no signs of a struggle or blood which might indicate an animal attack. The fact that the tools were missing seemed to indicate something out of the ordinary, particularly given the fact that the older man could barely walk unaided. When sniffer dogs were brought to the location, they simply sat there, unable to pick up any scents leading away from the pit. Some have suggested that Reverend de Metz may have wished to end his life, either in the woods or the nearby reservoir. But as a deeply religious man, such an idea would have been abhorrent to him, and he could not walk fast enough to leave without being seen by McSherry. He had simply disappeared. Examples of missing 411 incidents are not limited solely to the wooded areas of North America's national parks as the case of Dr. James McGrogan demonstrates. At the start of 2014, he had arrived in Indiana, having recently accepted a position working in the emergency room of a local hospital. On the morning of March the 14th, Dr. McGrogan travelled to a ski resort near Vail Mountain, situated within the boundaries of the White River National Forest. There, he met up with three friends who had arranged to go split snowboarding with him at a cabin situated nine miles inside the park. It had snowed heavily in the days leading up to the trip, and as they set off at 8.30am, they found the going tough. McGrogan was the most experienced member of the group, and as the morning progressed, he naturally started to pull ahead of the others, to a point where they lost sight of him. His companions naturally expected to find him waiting for them when they reached the cabin by mid-afternoon, 
but instead found it deserted. Having waited to see if the doctor would reappear, the group placed a call to the local authorities. McGrogan had been equipped with sufficient food and equipment to survive out in the wild, including a first aid kit and a sleeping bag, but as the days passed, the search for him was escalated, with helicopters and snowmobiles eventually deployed. As part of the search effort, attempts were made to track the doctor's mobile phone, but apart from one GPS ping on the day he went missing, no other transmissions were evident. Twenty days after his disappearance, McGrogan's battered remains were found by a group of skiers in the vicinity of Booth Falls. He had sustained multiple injuries to his head and upper torso, despite the fact that he was still wearing his skiing helmet. Bizarrely, although his snowboard lay nearby, his ski boots were missing, along with his outer coat and gloves. Stranger still, his mobile phone was located in one of his pockets, still operational, along with a spare battery. Why was an experienced skier like James McGrogan found over four and a half miles away from the trail he had been following? Where was his missing boots and clothes? Why, when he was in an area with active phone reception and a working mobile phone, did he not call someone for help if he had gotten lost? And why were authorities unable to triangulate his signal during the time he was missing? It has also been suggested that the missing 411 phenomenon is not restricted solely to North America. In May 2013, a huge search operation was mounted in the Snowy Mountains, which is situated in the Australian state of New South Wales. It is a case that continues to perplex the authorities, given the profile of the individual involved. Prabdeep Sron was 25 at the time he arrived at the Charlotte Pass Ski Resort on the 14th of May 2013. A Canadian national and reserve member of the country's armed forces, he was described by his friends as one of the strongest and smartest people they knew. He was in Australia studying law at Queensland's Bond University and planned to visit the Snowy Mountains before he returned home to Toronto. He set off into the mountains on a clear and sunny day, equipped with provisions and his mobile phone, and immediately vanished. Two park rangers who were working on an emergency shelter would later testify that they heard what they thought was a human scream, but when they had gone to search the area where the sound emanated from, they found nothing. Since Sron disappeared, there have been repeated attempts to locate him in the area where he was last seen. Vodafone have provided the Australian government with unlimited access to his phone records and data, and the Canadian Army have also sent specialist military resources into the mountains in an effort to locate their missing comrade. Despite all this combined technology and manpower, no trace of the missing student has ever been found. He had been due to return to Sydney the day after his disappearance, and had left a rental vehicle in the car park of the ski lodge. It was clear that he had only planned for a short trip, with no suggestion at all that he had any other intention besides taking in the beauty of his surroundings. Critics of the missing 411 theory often identify that despite similarities in many of the incidents, there are many factors which Pelidas seemingly chooses to ignore. It has also been argued that by assembling such a broad range of geographical and fundamentally different sets of circumstances, it becomes progressively difficult to investigate each occurrence in an impartial and focused manner. When disappearances are viewed through the lens of the missing 411 narrative, the possible reasons behind them have a tendency to become ever more fantastic, in an effort to find an explanation which satisfies as many incidents as possible from alien abduction to cryptid attacks, international drug cartels or the work of serial killer cults. No proposition, despite lacking evidence, is too outlandish to seize upon and propose. The fact remains that the great outdoors are very dangerous, filled with geological features, weather conditions and natural predators, which almost certainly account for many of these occurrences. 
In the case of the youngest victims, it is overwhelmingly probable that it was their inability to survive alone in a dangerous environment which cost them their lives. With older victims, a lot of these cases take on a much less paranormal vibe when certain facts come to light which Pelides had conveniently omitted. And yet, despite this sustained scepticism, there are still many cases which truly boggle the mind and seem to defy most, if not all, rational explanations. This is, indeed, an interesting subject, which we will no doubt visit again.